Hello and welcome back to Data Science CastNet. In today's video, we're going to be looking once again at the Kaggle LLM science exam competition. Um, and today we're going to be actually training a task specific model for this task. So if you remember in the very first video of the series, we showed how this is a multiple choice question style um, competition. And we could use an off the shelf language model without any training to attempt to answer those questions. And we, we came up with some clever ways to measure um, how likely a given answer was for a question to improve our score. Um, so that was in the first one. In the second one, we did a little bit of a diversion, um, speaking about how, since there's not much training data provided for this competition, um, there are ways that you can start with a few examples and then train a language model to produce more training examples. So in that case, we're fetching some context from Wikipedia, then we're using a language model to turn that into a question that follows the same structure as the competition. And at the end of that video, I pointed to a data set from my good friend Radek that was 6,000 nice curated um, questions in the same style as the competition that you could use for training. And we promised that in this video, we'd actually train a model on those questions. So that's what we're going to do. I'm going to spend most of the time just walking through a notebook. This will be linked in the description. And this isn't going to be necessarily an entry. It is just going to be exploring the concepts behind um, the entries that you'll see using this approach. So I'm running here on Google Colab. I've installed some libraries and logged into weights and biases. One of the things I'm going to show how to do is how you can very easily log statistics from your training runs to help debug and maybe improve on your training. Um, and then I've uploaded the training data sets here, train.csv and the additional 6,000 training examples that Radix provided. And what we're going to do today is we're going to use the original 200 sample training set from the competition as our validation set. So we have a way to measure performance without necessarily having to submit on Kaggle and wait for that process to finish. So loading in the data, just a refresher, or if you're joining this um, series now, we have a question and four or five, in this case, possible answers one of which is correct. And so that's the format that our data takes. Um, and so previously we, like I said, used an off-the-shelf language model, just either continuing, you know, here's your question, here's your answer. The answer is colon, uh, A, B, C, or D, and see what it continues or see what probabilities it assigns to the different answers. Um, but that's not really adapting the model at all. That's using it as it's designed, a language model. Um, in this notebook, we're gonna do something different and we're actually gonna do some model surgery and create a model that's optimized for this specific task, answering multiple choice questions. And so I'm throwing the data from this data frame into Hugging Face datasets just to match a notebook example that I'll also link. Um, and step one is gonna be to process this into a format to match the type of model we're gonna be using. Um, and that's non-trivial, but we'll go through the process step by step. And this is also something that's well documented in Hugging Face example notebooks and in a tutorial notebook for this Kaggle competition that I'll link later. So we're going to use a smaller model than the giant llama models we've used earlier. This is BERT, um, a kind of staple in the um, less like up to date, but the, well, it's not out of date, but it's been around for a few years, let me say, rather than the, the newest, latest, greatest llama models. And it tends to form a really nice backbone for these kinds of classification tasks. But there have since been better models. There's Distilbert, which is a smaller version that keeps the same performance or slightly better. Then there was um, Roberta and then Deberta from Microsoft um, and a number of others that have built on this idea. But the same basic idea is always going to be the same. Um, and the trick with this approach that we're going to take today um, is that we're going to be taking um, this kind of pairwise approach where we take the question and one possible answer. And that's going to constitute one input to the model. And it's going to work with those. So for example, if I take my tokenizer and I have two um, sentences that should be related or not, for example, this might be a question and an answer. It's going to tokenize those two into a single set of um, input IDs, the, the tokenized discrete representations of those tokens. Um, but you're going to see here it has these um, token type IDs that have zeros for the first sentence and ones for the second. Um, so this is kind of preparing this pair of inputs, right? A question and a possible answer to go through the model. Um, and so I have a pre-processing function here, again, adapted from the Hugging Face docs. Um, and what it's going to do is it's going to, from one, one row of the data frame or one item in the data set, where we have a question and then in five possible answers, we're now going to get a bunch of question answer pairs, combine them together um, and tokenize those and put them in the right shape. And so if I take the first um, eight examples from the data set, the training data set, um, you'll see that we have 
um, eight sets of input IDs, but each of those has five sets of input IDs within it, right? The second number here, and they're not all the same length. So one is length 43, 39, 42, 42, 43. Um, and if I take a look at just the third out of these eight examples, you'll see those five um, tokenized sentences. If I decode these, we have a special start token, then the question, what is one of the areas that this guy is known for, then a little separator token, and then the second sentence, and then another special token. Um, and so this is now taking a question and an answer and combining them into one single input. And we have one of these inputs for each of the five possible answers. Um, and so that's going to be the format that we present our data to the model in. Um, and we can pre-process the whole data set just to make the actual training faster, which is what's going on here. So how does this actually get turned into a choice, a multiple choice? Um, well, the, the secret lies in, I mean, this is all done for you, hugging faces auto model for multiple choice. Um, so if I pass in that model backbone, the BERT base uncased, that's just a generic BERT model. It's not designed for multiple choice. Um, and you're going to see a little warning here. Some weights of this BERT for multiple choice were not initialized from the model checkpoint, which is just a base model. Um, you should probably train this on a downstream task to be able to, to use it, which is exactly what we're planning to do. Um, but if we print out the model here, you'll see that it has a BERT attribute, right, which is like the base model, um, a set of embeddings, an encoder, um, and then it has some pooling, and then it has dropout and a classifier added on. So this is what takes the output embeddings that have been pooled from the, the kind of model backbone, and instead of predicting the next token in a sequence or something like that, this is instead our new uh, classification head. And what this does is this takes those outputs from the the base um, sort of model stem um, feeds them through a new linear layer with a single output feature. Now we have five choices. Shouldn't this have five outputs? Well, that's the trick. We, we're feeding in um, a question answer pair as one input. And for every input, we're going to get a, an output that's a single value, high or low. And the idea here is that we'll then interpret the set of outputs for all five question answer pairs. We'll get five outputs, right? One for each of them. And then we can use those as our logits or our probabilities, we can see which one is highest and hope that that matches the correct answer. All right, and so that's what's what's going to happen. Um, let's see, if we look at um, the first um, sample in our data set, in our training data set, we see that there's five sets of input IDs, one for each question answer pair. Um, if we look at the length of one of those sets of input IDs, it's 43. And we can again decode that just to check that it, it is a question and, and then an answer. Um, and so if we feed all of these five through the model, well, if we try, we get an error, right? Because not all of them are the same length. And so um, that's just one thing worth noting is that if these are drastically different, you might get issues. Um, the fix is to pad them all to the same length. So I'm using tokenizer.pad. I'm saying pad them all to match the length of the longest one. And then I can feed that through the model. And now I get um, one, uh, oh, so this is the inputs. So for every, um, there's, there's one example there's five possible answers, so five question answer pairs, and they're all now padded to 43 tokens, right? So if I decoded one of these that was shorter, it would be the question, set the answer separator, and then pad, 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 until it's the right length. Now we can feed it through the model and we get our output, which is a special wrapper around the actual values. Um, but what we care about are these, these are the raw outputs from the model. So I fed in five question answer pairs. For each one, I got that single output of that final linear layer. Um, and then the hope would be that whichever one of these is largest, that corresponds to the label. And so here, this one is larger than the others. That's going to be my prediction. Um, but of course, at this stage, the model isn't trained yet. So we need to train the model. Um, I copy the data collator from the Hugging Face uh, reference notebook. But you can also see that in the notebook that I'll suggest later, that also has this included. Um, this is just going to do that padding and arranging for you to make sure that everything is hunky-dory in terms of sizes, to handle arranging things in batches and so on. Um, so that's preparing the data. Um, one final thing before we actually start training, it's worthwhile having some measurement of how well this is doing on your actual task rather than just um, a loss value, which might not mean much to you. And so Hugging Face lets us feed in a custom metrics function, which takes in the predictions and the label IDs for the correct answers that we've set based on our data sets. Um, and so in this case, what I'm doing is I'm finding the um, 
the top three predictions rather than just the top one. So we can calculate accuracy, but also the competition metric, which is this um, accuracy, it's, what is it, mean average precision at three. Accuracy, like how many times is the first guess correct? Plus how many times is the second guess correct? Divided by two. Plus how many times is the third guess correct? Divided by three. And so that's our special custom metric. Um, and by implementing it here, we can see this during training. Um, okay, then we're ready to train. Um, like all Hugging Face Trainer examples, this is gonna set up some arguments and then call trainer.train. Um, a few things to notice here. One, I set this to evaluate every 200 steps um, and also to log the training stats every 200 steps rather than every epoch because we wanna do nice quick iteration and we wanna see what's going on. You could reduce that even further. Um, we set a batch size of eight. We have set uh, three epochs of training. Uh, the learning rate is five times 10 to the power of minus five. Um, and we've set re report to weights and biases and I've given this run a name, right? So now when I call trainer.train and feed in my training and evaluation data sets um, and my custom metrics, I get a few nice things. One is I get my printout every 200 steps of the training loss, the validation loss, the accuracy and the metric we actually care about this MAP measure. Um, but I also get a link which takes me to a weights and biases dashboard that has all of those same metrics logged um, but also stats about, you know, GPU usage, GPU memory, like you can see, I probably couldn't get away with double the batch size. And in fact, I tried it, I ran out of memory, um, power usage and so on. Um, okay, but what we really care about is this, um, this uh, performance, how well is this doing? And we can see even after 200 steps, it's doing pretty well. Um, it gets even better, 0.585. Um, but then it sort of plateaus and maybe even gets a little bit worse. Um, and if you look at the loss, you'll see the same thing. The losses both start out train and validation about 1.5. Um, that drops for the first few hundred steps. Um, but then the validation loss starts increasing again while the rest, uh, the training loss decreases and gets smaller and smaller. So this is a fairly common thing that you'll see when you're training a model. And the typical name for this is overfitting, right? I, I bet some of you were yelling that at your screen as I introduced this. This is like the classic pattern. The model learns too well to, to, to learn the training set, um, but the validation accuracy suffers because it's just memorizing the training set. So what can we do to fix that? Well, we can try some runs with different parameters, right? So I can try a second one here. I can use um, a lower learning rate. You could put that even smaller. Um, I can also use a larger batch size. And like I said, I couldn't do that with the memory, but what I can do is do gradient accumulation, which now stores the gradients from one batch and then a second batch. And only after it's processed two batches does it do one update. Um, so it's effectively like having a batch size of 16. Um, so you could try even larger using more gradient accumulation steps, train for more epochs, etc. Um, and if we try this, we see our um, our metric that we care about starts out low um, and it more gradually increases. Um, and in this case, it still um, plateaus, like the validation loss goes down and then starts to go up again. We might still be overfitting, um, but maybe it's a bit of progress. So that's where I end this notebook. Um, let's talk now about some things that you could do to improve this a lot further. And to do that, I'm gonna reference this blog post from my good friend Radek, who's also the one who um, has been creating a lot of resources for this competition. Um, and he's the one who made the notebook that I'm gonna suggest you actually use, having now gained this understanding from mine. Um, he has one up on Kaggle, how to actually make a set of predictions, um, how to train a newer model called Deep Earth V3, uh, and all these other tricks. Um, but specifically some ideas that he um, pushes out there one is, um, remember I said we have this model. Let's look back at the BERT model. Um, this base, this um, trunk, this uh, base model has been trained really extensively on a lot of data. And then we're plonking on this completely untrained classification head, right? And so training this whole model at once with a single learning rate, that doesn't really make sense, right? One thing you could do is freeze the, um, the, the, body of the model and only train this classifier until it's until it's reasonably well performing then you can unfreeze the rest of the network and continue training right if anyone's done fast ai you'll you'll recognize that approach um and that's something that radical calls out as well um one option wait, is let's see um oh, maybe it's not in here yeah here we go just train just the head and keep the rest of the model frozen um, and i'll show you what that looks like in code um, another idea that he had is um, we could also just completely freeze the embedding layers of the model 
and only update the rest of the model um, and use differential learning rates so that you're only training the early layers of the transformer network a tiny bit and it's mostly the the later layers and that classification head that are being trained um, use a learning rate schedule and um, let's see any other tips yeah there we go that's that's basically it um, use good quality data train the head first just that classification head then the rest of the model keep some of the parameters frozen or use a lower learning rate for most of the parameters and so these are all tips that would help avoid this overfitting issue um, and also just let you focus on the parts of the model that actually need to be learned um, yeah so i just wanted to highlight those tricks um, you can try them out via radix notebook so this is the one that i'll link um, we will be able to understand a lot of this um, having gone through mine and maybe through the hugging face example um, you'll see it's loading in the data setting up a data set collator loading in a tokenizer and setting up some training arguments auto model for multiple choice from pre-trained he's using a different backbone um, but the same sort of idea and then here you can see this is how if you wanted to freeze most of the network and only train the head you could do that um, setting up the trainer just like we did trainer.train um, my only suggestion would be, um, yeah, maybe check your logging every, you know, 200 steps or every 100 steps. Um, make sure that your validation loss is um, improving, or at least your accuracy is improving. Add your metrics so that you can get some feedback. And then you can iterate on the kinds of parameters you're using here, the learning rate, the approach, and so on. Um, I personally like uh, weights and biases for, for tracking this, so you can get the sort of run data that you can share later. And if you ever need to know what generated that, um, you can go and find the the configuration um, but I don't think Radix a fan <laughs> so you might also see what he suggests or just try even just reading out in the notebook like we did having this printout even that's super valuable to realize hey maybe I'm already over training because my validation loss goes down then it starts to go up again and my performance actually drops from 0.59 back down to 0.57 um, so I hope you found this useful um, this was just a yeah, a quick run through of this notebook, but hopefully this gives you an idea of a different approach to how to solve this kind of task, right? We saw using an off the shelf language model and kind of prompt engineering our way to a solution. Now we say, oh, we can actually like completely replace the final layers of this model, use the rest of the model as a kind of glorified feature extractor, fit a new classification head so that instead of anything, um, you know, these roundabout routes that we were taking with the prompt engineering, we're actually just producing um, some direct numbers for whether or not this is the correct answer, which we can then interpret and use to make predictions. So I hope you enjoyed that. In the next one, if there is a next one, we'll talk about some additional tricks for um, bringing in extra context or maybe yeah, just other, other hacks to improve the score even further. But for now, I think this gives a lot to, to be getting on with. Um, go and check out Radix Notebook, go and try some different baselines, uh, swap in different models, test out different parameters, and let me know how well you do. Thanks for watching.